I know like I'm addressing any issues that come up. Uh, okay. So um, the sort of broader motivation of the project comes from a, the, the observation that first, you know, economists have been increasingly interested in the role of and consequences of religious beliefs. And there's been a lot of really cool and exciting work understanding the consequences of religions and religious beliefs for Is it just me or is it kind of all stand? Yeah, yeah um, we can't hear it. Okay. It's the voice. Oh, drop out. Oh, uh, wow. This second time happened. <laughs> uh, let's, let's wait. Uh, I'm sure that she'll try to come back. Um, So there are a good a few good citizens there here. Good citizens here. <laughs> Maybe you, you should have sent another reminder, Sam. I did send on the one in the morning. Did you get yeah, that one? Another one. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Welcome back. Oh, she's back. I, I don't know what happened. It just like quit. <laughs> so no, it's sorry. okay. No worries. Yep. It's okay. We can see you now. All right, yay, let's start, let's try again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so economists have become increasingly interested in understanding the consequences of religion. So for things like human capital accumulation, for things like cooperation, um, and almost, basically almost all of this work has focused on what we would think of as more organized religion. So say Christianity and Islam. But of course, sort of that doesn't encompass the full set of the types of religious belief systems that people hold. And there's a wide variety of spiritual and supernatural beliefs that people hold across societies and historically. Um, and so we're going to be focusing on one of those types of belief systems today. Um, so we're going to focus on supernatural beliefs in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I'll tell you sort of some of the general features um, that this belief system has, but and, and while like sort of we can think of these types of beliefs as varying quite a lot across space because they're not going to be the same as these organized religions like Christianity or Islam, a lot of these features are replicated in supernatural belief systems across space. Um, so often they include belief in the idea that there are supernatural force, forces and ancestral spirits who can affect the world of the living. Um, there are also individuals who have magical powers, such as shaman or diviners. Um, so they have the ability to cast spells or to see into the future or to provide supernatural protection or harm. Um, there's also often this idea that um, objects can hold magical powers and these, the objects can therefore be used to protect yourself or to potentially harm others. And then in contrast to um, say Christianity and Islam, there's less of a belief in the idea that there is a God or spirits who is assigning moral judgment to your actions. So sort of in contrast to these moralizing God religions, there's also not going to be this assignment to heaven or hell based on how you live during your lifetime. Um, and so most of this work then that has focused on these big God religions like Christianity and Islam, one of the sort of findings that they found is that one of the potential benefits of this type of belief system, such as Christianity and Islam, with these moralizing God, with this moralizing God, is that it may help increase the extent and scope of cooperation. Um, and the idea is that you have this moralizing God who's watching over sort of what people do, and then the fact that you know that he's accumulating knowledge about how you lead your life and will eventually sort of assign judgment, in theory, then makes you kind of a better, more cooperative person. Um, and so then we have all of these other types of belief systems that have been prevalent sort of throughout history and across space. And, and sort of what's interesting is they tend to persist even well after the introduction of religions like Christianity and Islam. And in fact, Christianity and Islam often tend to incorporate some of these features of these smaller scale religions into how they actually function. Sarah, so just to I, give- I, Sorry, Sarah, can I just, sorry, can I just ask a quick question? 
Um, I, I, do, I do quite a bit of work on, on disability and something that often comes up is that, um, you know, it, it's seen to be some sort of divine punishment or, you know, a result of, you know, sins from a past life. So I wonder whether these traditional belief systems incorporate the, you know, the past life of people, um, you know, just in view of the fact that you stated that it wasn't really um, related to sort of current life um, and the way in which people live. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I hadn't thought about that so much. Um, so about the role of like reincarnation in these different belief systems. I mean, what I do know for at least Congo is that there's this sense of like connection with ancestors, but not but I, I don't know much about the idea of your own sort of past life and how that affects outcomes. But you do bring up a really interesting point about sort of the magical origins of like different sort of illnesses and ailments. Um, which will also feature a bit in what I'm talking about today. Great, thanks. Um, uh, so okay. just to, go ahead. So, yeah, so uh, I, I try to understand this uh, witchcraft beliefs. Um, mm -hmm. This is really about um, like you get judged and you, there'll be consequences um, uh, on your actions or your behaviors, or is 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 it, 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 so? If this is the case, then that must be a system that you know would you know um, sort of define what kind of actions or behavior are considered as punishable. And mm -hmm. does that does that kind of vary across um, you know areas or regions, or or, or even change over time? Yeah, this is a really good question, because I think one important distinction between, say, Christianity and these types of traditional supernatural beliefs is that it's much more clear about what things people should be doing and shouldn't be doing. And it's sort of centralized, like there's a common source of knowledge about what the right actions are. Yeah. And these traditional supernatural beliefs are much more decentralized. They don't have some common text that's dictating like what behavior or beliefs are. Um, and so it's definitely it's definitely different in that sense. And the type of actions I have in mind as punishable, I'm really going to be focusing on sort of um, interpersonal interactions. Right. But it, it's different in that, like Christianity says, you know, like treat your neighbors nicely or something. <laughs> um, and then, then it's a little bit more well defined criteria about what you might be punished on relative to these belief systems, where I don't think that's clear in a centralized way. That makes sense. Okay, right, got it. Thank you. Um, so here's just a map showing you the prevalence of belief in witchcraft across sub-Saharan Africa using data from Pew and Gallup surveys. Um, just a couple of things to note. So first, you can see that there are many parts of sub-Saharan Africa where almost everyone reports believing in witchcraft. Uh, so like particularly the case in parts of West Africa. Thanks. Oh my goodness. Um, and then where I work in Congo, you can see between like 60 and 80% of individuals report believing in witchcraft. Um, so all of this to say that sort of, while I'm studying Congo, these types of beliefs are really prevalent across the continent and aren't unique to Congo, nor in fact, are they unique to Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, unfortunately there's limited data on this, but we can plot the data we do have for other parts of the world. And so sort of individuals in other continents also report believing in witchcraft. So this isn't sort of unique to Sub-Saharan Africa. And I guess if we had data historically for Europe and the US, we would also find that like prevalence of belief in witchcraft uh, was like relevant for people. And you know, it may still be, uh, yeah. And so what we're going to try to ask in this paper is what are the consequences of superna traditional supernatural beliefs for pro-social behavior? Um, and there's a couple of potential answers. So the first is sort of thinking in, along the lines of the moralizing God religion type hypothesis, um, is that it may be that these types of supernatural beliefs um, promote social cohesion through the idea of supernatural punishment. So, it's a bit distinct from a moralizing God who's doing the punishment. Here you have the possibility of people who practice witchcraft to punish you for treating them in a way that they don't like. Alternatively, there could be no effect or there could be negative. So there could be adverse effects of, on social cohesion. And I'll describe more in detail why that might be the case. Okay, 
So the first hypothesis is that there's this positive effect of belief in witchcraft. So the idea here um, comes from the idea, the threat that basically um, if you mistreat individuals, they'll use magic against you to harm them. So for example, we have this quotation um, from Holland who writes, belief in witchcraft exerts this influence on society where people are reminded to not offend others because it may turn out that they're witches and it's better not to make enemies because that will lead to witchcraft. And so in this world, then this idea of supernatural threat and retaliation would lead individuals to act in a more pro-social manner to avoid this type of retaliation. Um, if we look at data from Gallup, which asked people sort of common reasons for visiting a witch doctor, it seems that this is actually a really um, plausible hypothesis. So when people report why you might go see a witch doctor, about 20% say it's to place a spell on someone another 14% to cure a spell that's been placed on them by someone else, and another 13 or 12% to inflict pain on someone else. So all of this is consistent with this idea that you can use witchcraft in these harmful ways to harm others, or, and likewise, you need to go to the witch doctor because someone's tried to do this to you. Okay. Uh, and then sorry, the other- uh, Sorry, go sorry ahead. to interrupt. Uh, um, so do, do you have uh, more specific like anecdotes or what kind of particular specific belief there that might actually encourage people to do social behavior? Like you are not so, so say for example, if you uh, if you don't be polite to other people, you'll be punished, or is there a particular what kind of spiritual or spirits that might be related to this? So you, you see what I'm saying? Is there any more specific anecdotes in this regard? I see. Um, you know, in this presentation, I don't have, let me, I don't know what happened to it. I had a slide full of very specific beliefs on sort of what this looks like in Congo. And I think I took it out, which was unfortunate. Um, but I guess to give you a sense of like specific types of beliefs that may sort of are like, so for example, if you believe someone's mistreated you, you can go to the witch doctor and you could get like an amulet made or something that you then leave, like this is what people were telling me. So you can go to the witch doctor and if you think like someone being, has like mistreated you, you could like leave this amulet or this fetish like at that person's place of work and this would bring them misfortune, for example. Is this what you have in mind in terms of anecdotes or? But, but that, that can be any kind of resentment. You know, that's private mm -hmm. just between individuals. And then yes. they choose to go to which doctor just to revenge. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it can be something that's not really related to pro-social in a sense. Like, you know, it's a good behavior. It could be just mm -hmm. like, okay, that guy, uh, that guy, uh, you know, say my wife cheated on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to get punished. And, and then that's really private stuff. It's not really related to, you know, yeah. Um, a good social behavior or something like that. Right? No, I see what you're saying. And I see the distinction you're making. Sorry, so what did you have in mind? Like what, what would be more along the lines of what you were interested in? Uh, no, no, I, I'm just trying to understand these because which crab believes is kind of mm -hmm. a, a broad idea. And then yep. I, I, I just want to uh, know more about what is the concrete specific system that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a system applied to every individual in a society. And then like, you know, this is the standard, this is the set of rules that you need to be behave this way. Yeah. So that you consider as a good citizen of the society. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to describe the, like what, what witchcraft looks like in this setting. Mm -hmm. But I, and I think this is sort of a recurrent theme in, in your questions. It's like, it's not going to be a set of rules in the same way there's a set of rules for for Christianity or Judaism or Islam. Okay. And it's going to be an important distinction and 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 may also help explain the results we find. Okay. So, so the second uh, yes, go ahead. I have this similar uh, questions as uh, okay. Simon, but really I think you have probably have to uh, define social behavior properly, what it means. So you, for you, for you, the child you're showing how, for hypothesis two, you, you look at trust and uh, behave. That's okay. That's very clearly defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the social behavior could be maybe you're talking about some kind of harmony in the community, 
that the so-called social behavior could be bad behavior, but is that commonly accepted by that particular community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. But let me let me get to like what we're doing, and then we can return to some of these comments um, when we get closer to the end. I think. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, so the second hypothesis is that there may actually be adverse effects of these types of supernatural belief systems. Um, so some related evidence comes from this work by Boris Gershman, who has this really interesting paper looking at the correlates of belief in witchcraft and belief in the evil eye uh, with levels of generalized trust. And he finds that sort of in places where people tend to believe a lot in witchcraft, they also report much lower levels of trust. And so this is suggestive evidence that there may be these adverse effects on pro-social behavior and social cohesion. Um, and so when we think about the evidence from Gershman, it's a really great paper, um, but it does leave us a bit short of causal evidence. So we aren't able to sort of deal with the fact that there's non-random assignment of beliefs in witchcraft. Um, and then, you know, Boris also has this really cool other paper where he's looking at how the slave trades may have led to the spread of witchcraft. So he can document that greater exposure to the slave trades in Sub-Saharan Africa is associated with higher witchcraft beliefs. And then likewise, there's more belief in witchcraft in parts of the Americas that received um, more enslaved peoples during the slave trade. Um, and then of course, Nathan also has some work looking at how the slave trade also may have affected levels of trust. And all of this makes it difficult then to sort of have this causal interpretation of Boris's paper. But it does provide some evidence that there may be this negative effect of witchcraft um, on pro-social behavior. And so what we're going to do in this paper then is try to speak to a couple of different literatures. So um, speak to this work on the effects of witchcraft. So Boris's work, and then also, for example, Ted Miguel has a paper on witch killings. Um, and then also some new and ongoing work looking at some of the potential functional purposes of these types of traditional supernatural beliefs. Uh, so for example, my co-author Nathan and Raul Sanchez de la Sierra have a paper looking at bulletproofing rituals in Congo and how these types of supernatural beliefs sort of enable people to cooperate and provide this public good of defending their villages against um, outside rebel groups. Um, and then I'll describe some other work later on about how local leaders may co-opt these beliefs to sort of increase their own support and authority. Um, so in the Congo, these supernatural beliefs are taking a lot of different forms. So for example, they take the form of these spells and fetishes that people can use to make money or harm others. Um, as I was just mentioning, Nathan has this paper on bulletproofing. Um, there's this um, man called the Thunder Man who is basically like a witch doctor who can strike people down if you, if you ask him to, <laughs> if they've done something terrible to you, for example. Um, there's this fear of dream enslavement. So like witches, for example, can enslave you in your dreams. So these are all lots of sort of different examples of what these types of supernatural beliefs entail. Okay, and so the term that I'll use to describe these supernatural beliefs or the relevant term um, for the area I work in is going to be Bokoko. So this is a Lingala word that basically I think translates into traditional beliefs, but it's going to encapsulate um, a couple of different components. So it's going to encapsulate sort of belief in witchcraft, belief in sorcery, and I'll describe the distinction in a second. Um, and it's also going to describe the idea that you have this connection with ancestors and the supernatural ability to connect with ancestors. So frequently there's this distinction made between witchcraft and sorcery. Um, so witchcraft has a really strong negative connotation and it's basically sort of incorporates the type of magic that's explicitly about harming others. And then you have in contrast sorcerers and sorcery, which has a slightly less bad connotation. So it can be used in, in helpful ways. So it can be used so that people can protect themselves or protect the community. Um, and then sort of also sorcerers and people with strong bococo can also use these powers um, to address supernatural ailments or as forms of healing. And then local leaders in particular are believed to have been endowed with sort of a lot of bococo, so a lot of supernatural ability. <laughs> 
And so if we're interested in then in the causal effect of these types of supernatural belief systems, um, I guess as an economist, we'd like to be able to randomize these, run an RCT where we assign people different belief systems and, and see what happens. Obviously that's entirely not plausible. Um, and so what we do is what we think is actually the next best thing. So we're going to run a series of lab experiments and surveys with people in our setting in Congo. Um, and we can't vary your own identity or your own beliefs, but what we can do is vary the identity of the person that you're paired with in these experiments. And so sometimes you'll be paired with someone who has a strong belief, and sometimes you'll be paired with someone who has a weak traditional belief. And then we can ask sort of how does your behavior change when you're paired with someone with these strong versus weak beliefs. Um, so we um, conduct these experiments with people um, in Congo, and we provide them information on the identity of the other player, including the strength of the other player's traditional beliefs. And you get, we fully randomize those sets of characteristics. And then we ask, um, are those with the stronger traditional beliefs treated in a less pro-social way or a more pro-social way? Um, so let me describe briefly the experiments that we do. So we're going to do a couple of different things. First, we're going to measure sort of how people behave towards people of different identities. And we're going to do that with three lab experiments. So we'll have a dictator game, which is the standard, you, the player one is given a, an endowment and asked to allocate that between themselves and another player. We have a choose your dictator game where our respondent uh, will view two profiles of other players, a person A and a person B and choose the person A or the person B to be a dictator for them in a dictator game. And then finally, we did a joy of destruction game where our respondent is told that they have been given an endowment and another player has been given an equal endowment. And then our respondent is the only one who makes a choice and they can choose whether to increase, decrease, or do nothing to the endowment of the other player. And it's called joy of destruction because it turns out that basically across a lot of settings, people are willing to pay some of their own money for the explicit purpose of just destroying someone else's money. The second thing we're going to do is once we observe behaviors, we're also interested in measuring norms. So the idea here is sort of what do people view as the acceptable thing to do? And does that vary based on the identity of the person in these different experiments? So we're going to use a strategy developed by Krupke and Weber. And we're going to um, incentivize this measurement of norms. And what's nice about this is we're asking people about what they think most people believe is the right thing to do. And we're going to pay them if they give what ends up being the right response. And, and so it's going to be hopefully less um, prone to experiment or demand effects. And we might, if we're worried that sort of our, our behavioral games measures are more susceptible to those. And then finally, we're going to do some work trying to understand how those with strong beliefs are perceived. Um, and we're going to use a series of conjunction fallacy questions, which I'll describe in detail when we get to that section. Right. But um, basically, yeah. go ahead. Uh, Sarah, do you uh, um, know or some of these more other uh, backgrounds of these people in terms of how these people who have stronger belief and those who have, who have weaker belief are different in other areas or aspects? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll present a table shortly on the correlates of belief in witchcraft within our sample. But I actually think there's quite a lot more we can do with our existing survey data. Like I'm gonna focus on the set of characteristics that we present when we give people information on about the other player. But we have a whole bunch of survey data on like asset ownership and uh, you know where they grew up and a whole bunch of things that we could have a, a table with that information and we don't have that at the moment. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we have um, data from two different samples. Um, I'm gonna call one the city sample and one the villages sample. So the city sample we collected data from in 2018 and 2019. And we have 520 randomly selected individuals from this city that we work in. Um, and sort of uh, when we were doing our random sampling, we restricted individuals to participate if they were from the three largest ethnic groups in the region. And that's because one of the pieces of information we give on the other players is co-ethnicity. And it was going to be hard to do these payouts if we um, 
used many of the smaller ethnic groups. And then we also focused on people with strong or very strong beliefs in the Christian God. And that had to do also with these matching concerns because we started out by doing a big screening survey with like thousands of individuals from this city. And it turns out most people like, like 90 something percent report a strong or very strong belief in the Christian God. So again, it would have made these profiles of um, other players difficult to pay out if, um, if we incorporated people with um, weaker beliefs. So we did this in 2018 and 2019, the games in 2018, and then these, um, the uh, enormous measurement in 2019. And then in 2021, we went back and replicated our entire protocol, but now with a rural sample. So we randomly selected 50 villages in the area we work in. Um, and we collected data from 600 individuals, so 12 people per village. And this time we didn't have to do this uh, restricted screening primarily because everyone was from the same ethnic group. And then there's a lot more variation or there's some more variation in belief in the Christian God. Okay. So this is the region we work in. We're working in North, um, Northern Congo. Um, I don't tell you specifically the area because our IRB asked us to, to mask the location. And then this gives you a sense of the distribution of um, our villages. Okay, so for the city sample, um, just a couple of things to point out. So about 50% of the sample has completed primary school um, and 33% of the sample has completed secondary school. Um, most people have fairly strong traditional beliefs and I'll get more into that in a minute. And then by construction, based on our screening, people also have very strong beliefs in the Christian God. Um, for the villages sample, um, slightly less educated, so only 15% of the sample will have completed secondary. Almost everyone is from this Mbaka ethnic group. Um, slightly less strong belief in the Christian God, but equally strong uh, traditional beliefs. So we can pull our samples and just sort of look at how strongly held our beliefs in supernatural power, such as witchcraft. And you can see that 46% of the sample report a very strong belief, and then 26% a strong belief. So sort of the vast majority of people hold these beliefs in a strong way. Um, we have a couple of other proxies of measures of strength of belief. So one is sort of whether or not you report having been harmed by a witch, witchcraft in the past. Um, and 57% of the sample report that that's happened to them. And then 41% report sort of actively worrying about um, harm by supernatural means. Um, so all of this to say that this is sort of meaningful for the way people understand their own lives. Um, so if we look at whether or not witchcraft is an effective means to harm others, you can see basically everyone in the sample believes that witchcraft is effective or very effective at harming others. Um, so here are some of the correlates for the city sample. We have a lot more survey data. So Simon, if you had thoughts on like what other factors you'd really like to see correlates of, like let me know. The reason I'm focusing on these different um, characteristics is because when we tell people about the other player, we're giving them seven pieces of information and it basically corresponds to this information. So um, in general, men tend to have less strong belief in witchcraft. So the coefficient's negative. Um, those with um, more years of education report less strong beliefs. Um, kind of interesting is that there's this positive correlation between, between strength of belief in the Christian God and belief in witchcraft. And I think a lot of people's priors are that these should be substitutes, that people adopt Christianity and then no longer hold these beliefs. But that's really not the case in this context. People hold them simultaneously. Um, and we observe fairly similar patterns for our sample um, from the villages. So those with more education report less strong belief. And then um, having this uh, positive correlation between belief in the Christian God and these traditional beliefs. Um, so just a, a quick aside on this relationship we observe between belief in witchcraft and um, belief in Christianity. Um, is that at first it might seem surprising, but then sort of, if we think a little bit about the context, it's actually a little bit less surprising. So if you use this data from Gallup, you can ask people, does prayer protect one from witch doctors? And 84% of the sample report that yes. 
sort of, you can use the Christian church to protect yourself from these supernatural forces that are from witchcraft. And in the setting where I work in, basically, you know, if we think of the religious marketplace, it was basically entirely dominated by Protestants and Catholics until fairly recently, where you get the entry of a whole bunch of diverse different churches. So Pentecostal churches, evangelical churches, born again churches. And what's really interesting about the strategy of these churches is they tend to integrate these pre-existing belief systems into their teachings. So they don't try to say witchcraft isn't real or anything. They say, actually, witchcraft is real and it's a threat. But luckily, if you come to church every Sunday and donate a lot of money, we can help protect you from like the negative effects of, of witchcraft. So it's a really successful strategy, or it seems to be. I, I don't have data on this. Observationally, these churches just seem to be really taking off. And I just, yeah, this may be one of the reasons why that they're quite popular. Um, okay, so let me describe the experimental setup. Uh, we have a team of enumerators um, that visit um, respondents in their home and they interview them outside, um, like, or, you know, in a shaded place outside. Um, they administer a series of test questions in local language. They describe the experiments to them, all of this to ensure that individuals understand the different experiments. Um, when actual allocation decisions are being made, um, the respondent is given this umbrella because, you know, sometimes the allocations involve actual money. So this way they feel that they can have privacy when they make their allocation choices. Um, so that's just an example of, of what the setup looks like. Um, and then, as I was saying, we give lots of different pieces of information on the other player. So we tell them about the other player's age group, whether or not they're old or young. We tell them about the other player's sex, so man or woman, um, education level, whether or not they're from a co-ethnic or non-co-ethnic. Um, the other player's strength of belief in the Christian God, which in the um, city sample will just be strong or very strong. And then in the villages sample um, will range from very weak to very strong. Um, the traditional beliefs measure will be weak, neither weak nor strong, strong or very strong. And then we'll tell them information on whether or not um, they grew up in a rural area or in a city. Um, so let me just tell you very precisely how we communicate this information. So we tell them that you're gonna be playing with someone randomly chosen from the population of the city or the area. And we say, we can't tell you exactly who, but we'll give you some pieces of information. So we'll tell you X number, six, number, six things about the other player. Um, now, the other player is an old woman that completed primary that is from your ethnic group, that has a strong belief in the Christian God, that has a weak belief in Bakoko, and who did not grow up in this area, for example, not grow up in the city, for example. So they would hear this paragraph about the other player before making their choices in these different experiments. Um, so let me tell you about our two main baseline uh, specifications. So here's our first specification where we have our outcome of interest for respondent I, who's been randomly paired with player J. Um, and we're interested in this beta two coefficient, which is the coefficient on player J's strength of traditional beliefs. We'll also include controls for player one's uh, traditional belief strength. And then we'll have a series of fixed effects for all of those characteristics that I just read to you. So for player J, we'll have fixed effects for their age group, for their, for their sex, um, for their strength of belief in the Christian God, et cetera. And then we'll have the analogous set of fixed effects for our respondents characteristics as well. So for all of those different pieces of information for both player I and player J, we have fixed effects. And of course, we're interested in the effect of player J's traditional beliefs on the respondents behavior. And then in the second um, estimating equation, we're going to take advantage of the fact that um, our respondents complete the experiments twice and we stratify based on the other player's uh, strength of traditional belief. So every time you'll be paired with someone with a strong belief one time and a weak belief another time. And so we can have then this version where we have respondent fixed effects. And then in addition, we put all of those player J control fixed effects. Yes, Simon. Uh, so um, I, I remember you have very few people had a weak belief, right? Most of yeah, them it's are not very. Uh, so when you match a pair of people uh, with 
is it possible that some of those um, weak levers have uh, been uh, playing games more times than others, or because you have very few weak levers? Yeah. Yeah. No, this is a really good question. So the way we we the way we did this is basically, except for the choose your dictator game, the um, joy of destruction game and dictator game basically involve our respondents making a choice, and then we have to enact that choice with someone who matches that profile that we randomly assigned. And so we basically use that big sort of screening survey that we did in order to have profiles that we can use to enact the payments. And then for the choose your dictator game, we would then find people who would then be the dictator that would then be the other players payout. Um, does that make so, so that we could then calculate player ones, um, or sorry, our respondents payout for the choose your dictator game. And so um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the payouts are a little bit complicated, but that from our respondents perspective, they were basically paid out based on their own choices. And then Usually our matching happened with outside of this core sample. So like some people who were randomly selected in our screening survey, they could then be used to basically calculate multiple people's payouts and then they would receive some money, but they're sort of outside of this set of experiments, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think probably like, the concern is that if you think about the profiles people are seeing relative to their actual proportion in the population, we fully randomized the full set of profile characteristics that they see, but then some combination of characteristics are going to be less probable than others. So that might be what you have in mind when you're asking this question, I, I think. Um, and we haven't really done anything, to, but we could restrict to the most common um, types of people that actually exist in the population. Okay. So uh, just for, a quick question, uh, okay. only for my own clarification. I mean, uh, the scenario you uh, you gave to the to the respondents. So mm -hmm. how do you decide about those scenarios? Did you get this information from your service you did before this experiment? Do you mean like this this information here? Yeah, exactly. Why did we choose those seven pieces of information? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and yeah. Yeah. So um, I think this comes back to actually yeah one of Simon's earlier questions is what types of characteristics are correlated with the beliefs that people have, and so we wanted to do two things with these pieces of information is first like sort of pin down more about this other person for them. So we pick sort of common things that you might know about other people when you meet them or interact with them. Um, and then the second thing was we wanted to sort of, you know, hide our interest in the effects of belief in witchcraft. So we couldn't just say, you're paired with a strong believer in witchcraft. What do you want to do? <laughs> so by giving them these other pieces of information, they have to think a little bit more carefully. And it's a little bit less obvious, I think, what our interests are. Um, but for example, like, you know, uh, people who complete secondary are more likely to be wealthier and that type of thing. So it's, this just helps people have a better understanding of the type of person that they're interacting with, if that makes sense. So is it, uh, is it the case that this Christian God belief and the witchcraft are supposed to be the opposite forces in their mm -hmm. beliefs? Or that sense? is that the case? <clears throat> I don't I don't think I understand your question. What do you mean like the opposite? So, so early on you make this example like you someone <clears throat> uh, want to fend off the threat from the witchcraft, they can go to the church and they pray, right? So, yeah. so, so I saw that so that means that people there kind of believe that uh, believe in Christian. So the Christian God is the opposite side of the witchcraft forces. Is that a kind of a case? I mean, I, I don't know if it's like the opposite so much as it can be used to counter the effects of witchcraft. I mean, witchcraft can also be used to counter the effects of witchcraft. So I, I don't, I guess I don't think of them as opposites. And then of course, you know, people believe in both simultaneously. Um, but I think this is actually, yeah, 
people tend to have a much more positive connotation of Christian beliefs than they're going to have of these witchcraft beliefs, which is going to come out in the conjunction fallacy question. So, so maybe, maybe yes, maybe it's helpful to think of it as opposites. I just hadn't thought about it in those terms, like that type of dichotomy. Oh, so they are now like a good versus evil. They, they can be on the I same mean, side, it, not necessary. No, I, I, you might be right. Actually, I just hadn't thought about it in that terms. But if you, you'll see from our conjunction fallacy questions that that basically is what comes out of this is that people have many positive connotations for people who believe in witchcraft and make like, I'm sorry, Christianity. So they think lots of positive things about those types of people and then think lots of negative things about people who have uh, strong beliefs in witchcraft. So yeah, maybe that maybe maybe that's the right way to think about. It. I just hadn't thought about it quite in those terms. Oh yeah, I've done, I I I, I saw because I I've seen you put these two sentences. You know, the great belief in strong belief in Christian God here, and followed by the weak belief in witchcraft. And I thought you were motivated by this. Ah uh, no, I just um so I I wanted to. I put those beliefs together because I think of all the pieces of information that people hear, those might be the least that they're accustomed to. Uh -huh. um, and so I just put them, them with each other. And then from the perspective of the enumerator, like to make it a little bit easier to deliver. But um, I mean, it didn't have to be like that. This was okay. just like implementation considerations. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then just a quick aside. So when we're looking at the effects of the other players, traditional beliefs, we're going to look at it in a couple of different ways. So we have this one to four variable that goes from weak or very weak to very strong belief in witchcraft. We can also construct indicator variables for each category of strength of belief where um, weak or very weak belief is the omitted category. And then finally, we can construct um, an indicator variable that aggregates strong or very strong beliefs, since that's basically what we um, stratify on when individuals play. Um, and then we'll just present results for these three different uh, ways. So the first game is the dictator game, as I mentioned. Uh, the participants are given 1,000 uh, Congolese francs. So they're given 10 100 CF bills. And then they're given two envelopes, one that's labeled in Gai, which means for yourself, the other, which says Mobeti Lisano 2, so the other player. And then they'll take their 10 sort of CF bills and then they'll physically allocate them um, as they like across the um, envelopes to decide sort of how much they want to keep for themselves and how much for the other player. And they're going to play the dictator game twice. And one time they'll view someone with weak beliefs, and one time they'll view someone with strong beliefs. And of course, that order is randomized um, across participants. So here are the results um, from the dictator game for the city sample. Um, so on average, people allocate a little bit less than 500 francs to the other player. Um, oh, and also just let me orient you a little bit in the tables because all of the tables are set up in basically the same way. So the odd number columns are going to be our first specification where we have fixed effects for both the player I and player J characteristics. The even number columns are going to be that specification where we have respondent fixed effects. So we take advantage of variation within an individual. Um, and then, um, yeah, our measures are, we just present for those three different measures. And I think the easiest columns to focus on are columns five and six, where we aggregate the strong and very strong categories of the other player's belief. And, and then we also present standard errors, uh, robust standard errors, and then standard errors clustered at the individual level. So for columns five and six, we find that when you're paired with someone with a strong or very strong belief, people allocate fewer Congolese francs towards them. So 30 fewer francs um, in this dictator game. Um, we do the analogous experiment in the villages. And I guess as a heads up, this is going to be the one result that doesn't fully replicate across our city and villages sample. So we find this negative coefficient, but it, it, but it isn't significant. So individuals are allocating fewer francs, um, but the amount isn't significant in our villages sample relative to our city sample. I mean, just, just on that, Sarah, are you clustering yeah. at the, I mean, are you clustering standard errors here or, um, I mean, I, I missed the discussion on the study design. Yeah, so, so the standard errors are clustered at the individual level. Mm, okay. Yeah. And then robust standard errors are also presented. Thanks. 
Um, so the second experiment is the choose your dictator game. So here a participant is given uh, two, two profiles, um, a person A and a person B. And then they're given those same seven pieces of information about person A and person B. And then they have to choose one of those two people to be a dictator for them in the dictator game. Um, and then whatever allocation choice that person makes will then affect sort of how much money um, the respondent receives. And then I guess the way we can think about the choose your dictator game is as measuring sort of your altruism towards that person in the sense you want them to be able to participate in this game and your expectations about how altruistic that type of person is to someone like you. Um, so the participant sees these two profiles, they choose one of those two players to be a dictator for them, and then they report their choice to the enumerator. And they're going to play this game twice. And then also um, each time they play, one of the people has a strong belief and one of the people has a weak belief. Okay. So here, um, again, let's just focus on columns five of six. So by, by construction, you can only choose one of the two people. So the mean of, you know, chose the player is um, half. half. Um, and you're 36 percentage points less likely to choose someone if they have a strong or very strong belief in traditional belief. So this is from our city sample. And we find um, a very similar effect size in our village sample. So 34 percentage points less likely to choose the other player if they have these strong or very strong beliefs. And then the final experiment is this joy of destruction games. We have a player one and a player two. Um, we tell them, the, the respondent, that bo they both received 2,000 Congolese francs. Also as a benchmark, um, about 1,600 francs was a dollar at the time we did this. Um, these are non-negligible amounts. Like if people were formerly employed, then the um, minimum wage would be three US dollars a day, but most people aren't formally employed. So they're not really, and even if they are, like I don't, people aren't always following the rules. So, um, so our respondent is told that both they and then this other player have been given 2000 francs. And then they have to choose to do one of three things. So they can choose to pay 200 of their own endowment to decrease the other player's endowment by a thousand. They can choose to do nothing, in which case everyone goes home with 2000. Or they can choose to pay 200 of their own endowment to increase the other player's payoff by a thousand, in which case they go home with 1,800 and the other player goes home with 3,000. Um, and so the respondents would receive a little form like this one where they could then mark their choice um, we tried to make it pretty clear just what the different choices are. This is, um, well, people do have a decent amount of schooling. There's just varying levels of, of um, literacy. And then again, uh, people play the game twice, again, stratified by the other players' uh, supernatural beliefs. Okay. So um, what we find is that in this Joy of Destruction game, individuals are basically less likely to increase the other player's endowment and more likely to decrease the other player's endowment when that other player has a strong traditional belief. So these are the results from the city sample. And this is the result from the villages sample. So sort of consistent across these two samples, we find this negative effect in the joy of destruction as well. And so sort of in summary for these experiments, it seems that very consistently, we observe less pro-social behavior towards a player, another player who has strong traditional beliefs. Um, we don't find evidence that player one's own beliefs matter in a consistent way related to pro-social behavior. So we don't find that sort of those with stronger beliefs in which perhaps are consistently, you know, less generous or more destructive. Um, we also don't find consistent evidence on the interactions between player one and player two's beliefs. Okay. Um, so like the interaction term between player one beliefs and player two. Um, so I, I won't spend much more time on that for the moment. Um, we do find some evidence, however, that those interactions, so that if you're paired with, it's, if you're a player one paired with the player two and you both have strong beliefs in the joy of destruction, you're slightly less likely to um, behave negatively towards them. Okay, so we did all of those experiments, we find these negative effects. And then sort of the next question we had was, 
what are the actual norms of behavior? So we've observed a certain set of behavior, it's quite negative. And then the question is, is what we observe consistent with what people view as the right thing to do in this situation? And so we use this methodology from Krupka and Weber, which is an incentivized measure of what most people perceive as appropriate in various scenarios. And like I was saying earlier, what's nice about this is it may be less susceptible to demand effects uh, because we're measuring not your own beliefs, but what you say other people are going to say is the right thing to do. Um, and it's particularly since we observe these negative effects of belief in witchcraft in the earlier ones, they might be thinking that, you know, foreigners, they must be Christians, they probably want us to like punish people with belief in witchcraft or something. And so this will be helpful with addressing that. Um, so what we'll do is we'll ask people about how appropriate different behaviors are in these games. And for the city, um, we follow up with our sample a year later, so we use, lose a, a few people. And then for the um, villages sample, they did the survey one and the survey two within the same week, so we were able to keep everyone. And as before, we randomly vary the characteristics of the people they see. And then um, again, people play twice so we can stratify on the strength of belief of the other player. So let me tell you precisely how we do the norms measurement. So we describe the situation. So in this case, it'll be the, the experimental choice. And we want them to evaluate how socially appropriate uh, a decision is. And we'll define socially appropriate as um, behavior that most people in this area agree is the correct or ethical thing to do. Or another way to think about it, if people choose something socially inappropriate, other people might be angry. And then they'll have to say something very socially inappropriate to very socially appropriate. Um, and so again, it's not what they think is the right thing to do, what they believe the most common choice of other participants is. Um, and so that we'll think of that as a measure of the social norm. So what most people agree um, people are going to say. And then if they correctly answer these questions, they're eligible for this additional bonus payment of either 5,000 in the city or 3,000 in uh, the village. Um, and this is to sort of encourage them to think really carefully about the scenario. So they could earn up to 15,000 in the city or 9,000 in the village if they correctly answer for each game, all of the um, responses. Okay. So in the dictator game, there's 11 possible allocations to the other player. So zero to a thousand uh, Congolese francs can be allocated to the other player. And so for each of these possible allocations, we ask how appropriate that allocation is. Likewise, for the choose your dictator game, you can choose a person A or you can choose a person B. So we ask how appropriate is it to choose that person A or this person B. And then finally, for the joy of destruction, there's three choices. So to reduce, to do nothing, or to increase. And then the estimating equations are the same. So I'll just go ahead and skip over those. Okay, so here are the results for the dictator game. Here we're presenting what is the effect of the other player's uh, strength of traditional belief on how appropriate the action is. Um, in the left panel, we have that specification one. And on the right panel, we have the specification with the player one fixed effects. So the way to interpret it is that if we look at zero, for example, there's no effect of the other player's traditional beliefs on how appropriate it is to allocate zero francs to the other player. And it turns out this is because most people think that it's just not appropriate to allocate zero to another player, regardless of any of their characteristics. You can see that it becomes slightly more um, acceptable to allocate these smaller amounts to the other player if they have a strong belief in witchcraft or a stronger belief in witchcraft. And then it's less acceptable to allocate these larger amounts to the other player if they have a strong belief in witchcraft. Um, this is for the city sample. And then we observe the same patterns in the village sample. So it's more appropriate to allocate small amounts and less appropriate to allocate larger amounts. For the choose your dictator game, we find that um, if you're paired with someone with a strong or very strong belief in, in witchcraft, it is less appropriate to choose them and sort of it's from moving from like socially appropriate to basically somewhat socially inappropriate is the effect size. Right, uh, I am a bit slow, but I'm kind of stuck from the, the, the graph here. <laughs> yeah. Nonlinearity, very interesting. It's kind of fascinating, but 
Um, so it goes from um, zero and then positive and then turn to negative. So what, what's your take on this nonlinearity here? Um, so what I think is that I should have put the mean of how appropriate it is to allocate zero in general. Yeah. because I think that's important for interpreting the effects, but basically like at zero, no one thinks it's appropriate. So for the most part, like here, for example, if like no one thinks the action's appropriate, there's no effect of the other player's characteristic on how appropriate it is, if that makes sense. Um, and then I guess I, I, the way I think about it is these smaller allocations are more appropriate because these people are somehow less liked or Sort of seen as deserving of less, while it's less appropriate to make these larger allocations uh, because that seems too generous. If that, if, but maybe I'm not right. Is this possible that there's some um, reference dependent in the sense that um, it has something to do with their average income, or um, you know, people? To think about what kind of um, income or payment is considered as appropriate and above that that's uh, that's um, not acceptable so would this be like by player one's own income or partitioned by perceived income of the other player is that I, just so i understand what you mean is that the payout to uh player one or player two i don't remember this is the um, how much how appropriate it is to allocate a particular to player amount to player two right yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's it's really a distinction between uh, one or two, but I, I I just don't know why there's a turning point at 400. Uh, 500, oh, 500. 500. Yeah, yeah, 500, yeah. Okay, I'll have to think more about this. I mean, I think, I guess the way I had just thought about it is that it's like, you know, small amounts are fine, but big amounts are definitely not fine, sort of. Yeah, yeah. But maybe I'm, I, yeah, maybe I'm not following your question. No, no, I mean, I, I guess it's a why below 505, but above 500 is not good. Well, I'm five not. is like also like people anchor pretty strongly on that as being like a fairly fair allocation. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it'll just be helpful, yeah, to interpret these effects relative to what the average sort of social acceptability of each action is. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. How acceptable. Okay. Um, all right. So it's also less acceptable to choose them as the other player in the choose your dictator game. That's the case across both the city and the villages sample. And then for the joy of destruction game, we find it's more acceptable to decrease their endowment. There's no effect on doing nothing and it's less acceptable to increase their endowment, which I, I think is pretty consistent with the dictator game results. Um, and then we find the same um, pattern in the villages sample. Okay, so sort of the way I think about the norms measurement exercise is that we observe this antisocial behavior towards those who have these strong traditional beliefs in the set of experiments that we ran. And we find that that's that type of antisocial behavior towards them is actually entirely also consistent with what people think is the right thing to do here. So not only do people behave less pro-socially towards these types of individuals, people also agree that that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, and so the sort of last thing that we are interested in is how are those with these strong traditional beliefs viewed? Um, and we're going to ask a series of conjunction fallacy questions in order to try to measure that. So just um, quickly, the conjunction fallacy is basically when people rate the conjunction of two events as more likely than one of the single events. And this was coined by Tversky and Kahneman. And they have this example from their paper of Linda, who is 31 and single and outspoken and very bright. And she majored in philosophy and she attends you know, demonstrations and she cares about social issues. And then they'll ask people, which is more likely? Is it more likely that Linda is a bank teller or more likely that Linda is a bank teller and is activist in the feminist movement? And then what happens is people will choose option two, that she's a bank teller and active in the feminist movement because these different characteristics that we describe about Linda sort of are representative of how they think about feminists. And so we're going to take questions like these 
to ask sort of what types of characteristics do people view as representative of those who say believe in witchcraft or representative of those who believe in the Christian God. So we do this in the urban sample. Um, so we select another group of individuals because this is from 2021 and we weren't necessarily going to be able to track everyone down. We ask a series of these conjunction fallacy questions. And so we'll sometimes present a positive scenario where we present positive information about the other player, or about the person, or sometimes we'll do negative traits. And then we'll basically have a baseline characteristic. So for Linda, it's a bank teller. For us, it'll be something like a cook or whether or not they're married or whether or not they're a farmer. And then they'll choose between that base, the baseline characteristic or the baseline characteristic plus a strong believer in Bococo or the baseline characteristic plus a strong believer in the Christian God. And so sort of as with like Linda, where people um, assume that these types of characteristics are representative of feminists, we'll ask, are these positive characteristics representative of someone who's a believer in Bococo or believer in a Christian God? Um, so here's some sample scenarios that we came up with. So we have a scenario where we're trying to describe someone who's well-liked. So we have Marie and she lives in the city and everyone likes her and is happy to spend time with her. So is it more probable that Marie is a farmer? And Marie is a farmer who's a strong believer in Bococo a Marie's a farmer who's a strong believer in the Christian God. And the idea here is that, that people tend to view sort of well-liked people as representative of those who are strong believers in the Christian God, then they'll make the conjunction fallacy and choose three. Uh, or if they're, you know, more likely to assume that someone who's well-liked in the community is a strong believer in Bococo, then they'll choose two. And then we have scenarios that are well-liked, and then we also have the analogous disliked and one's like jealous or not jealous, for example. So like um, for jealous, we have Fiston and he's 30 and he's really jealous about other people's success. And when he thinks about their achievements, he gets really angry. And then is it more likely he's a brick maker or a brick maker, yeah, whatever. So, okay, so what do we find? Um, so what we find first is, let me just discuss the food one because you know, I gave you lots of examples that are sort of laden, like either positively or negatively. But we also have a scenario where we talk about um, like Pierre and Pierre really likes to eat and his favorite food is chicken and rice. And he's always very happy when his wife makes him chicken and rice or something like that, you know, and he gets to eat his chicken and rice. And so when people hear about someone who likes to eat chicken and rice, they don't make the conjunction fallacy. So 64% just choose the baseline characteristic. And while some people are making the conjunction fallacy, most people aren't. But then let's turn to these positive traits. So we have, you know, honest, uh, not jealous, someone who's generous, someone who isn't vindictive, someone who's well liked. When we have these scenarios that are emphasizing these positive traits, most people are making the conjunction fallacy. If you look at the baseline and God column. And then they're making the conjunction fallacy with those who are strong believers in God. If we then look at these negative traits like dishonest or jealous or not generous or vindictive, then we find that again, people are making the conjunction fallacy. And they're also making the conjunction fallacy in a different way than they were with the positive traits. They're now inferring that these people are likely are, are representative of those who are believers in witchcraft. Um, so it seems that, you know, positive traits seem to be representative of the Christian believers and these negative traits representative of the, um, the traditional belief believers. And then we thought there might be something with wealthy and poor, but it, it doesn't come out quite as clearly uh, with those questions. Um, and the reason it could go either way is sort of that wealthy people can sometimes be accused of using witchcraft to become wealthy. But there's also this idea of like, you know, if you're a really good Christian, you can become wealthy. Uh, so it wasn't entirely clear which way it would go. And I, I think the patterns are, are less obvious there. Okay. Um, so in summary, we find that sort of with the presence of these supernatural beliefs seems to systematically induce less pro-social behavior. And not only that, that's entirely what most people agree is the right thing to do. Um, and even though I guess the other thing to emphasize is that most of our sample reports having strong or very strong traditional beliefs, and yet they themselves are making these negative inferences around the way these other people are viewed. Um, 
And so we view all of this evidence as sort of consistently rejecting the hypothesis that these traditional supernatural beliefs are promoting pro-social behavior in the same way these moralizing God religions are. And it seems to be much more consistent than with the work from, from Gershman that it may actually lead to less pro-social behavior. And so, you know, if, if we had found that it induces pro-social behavior, then it's like the paper's done. It's like, great, we're trying to understand what is the function of these types of belief systems. We find that it has these, you know, positive effects. Um, so from this evolutionary perspective, we could see what the benefits of these types of beliefs are. But we're actually finding these really negative effects. Like it's individually costly to hold these beliefs because it's more acceptable to treat people who hold these beliefs in a negative way. And so there's a couple of, you know, classes of explanations that we're trying to understand at this point to understand what explains like um, what we observe. So one explanation for why we see the persistence of these beliefs, even though they seem to have these negative effects, is that these super supernatural beliefs come in this bundle and you can't really discard negative elements of this bundle. And I'll describe that in more detail in a second. Uh, the other class is that there may be other benefits of these supernatural beliefs that we're not measuring in this study, but that may help explain why they continue to persist. And then finally, it could be that these beliefs were beneficial in the past, but are no longer beneficial today. And so this is basically this idea of cultural mismatch where the environment has changed and something that you know, was evolutionarily um, beneficial in the past is no longer beneficial given this change in the environment. And so what we have in, in mind here are sort of changes induced by the introduction of Christianity, um, which may have had an effect on how witchcraft beliefs are perceived in this setting. Um, so I think I have a few more minutes. So I'll just take a second to clarify these different hypotheses and sort of where we're headed next with the project. Um, so if we think about this supernatural belief bundle, it, it was this combination of, you know, connection with the ancestors, witchcraft, sorcery, and, you know, witchcraft in particular is viewed quite badly, but it may be difficult to reject this entire cultural bundle. So for example, you know, connections with the ancestors is really important for people's own sense of identity. It's important for local politics. Um, it would be hard though to re reject this idea of connection with the ancestors. I mean, sorry, to reject the idea of uh, witchcraft and sorcery, for example, but just keep that one element of the bundle. Um, I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, and so it's sort of like, yeah. And like Bococo is also viewed as sort of this important factor for traditional healing. Um, and so you can't sort of get rid of the negative elements without also getting rid of the things that people view more positively, like um, sort of the traditional healing part of it. Um, the other sort of explanation is that there's other benefits of supernatural beliefs. So we focused on pro-social behavior, but of course it may be that there's other things that it's helping with. So it may help with stress management. So people can fare better psychologically if they have some sense of why something bad happened to them, for example. Um, and in other people, we're trying to understand the potential political benefits of these supernatural beliefs. So how local leaders may leverage them to boost, uh, boost their own sort of perceived authority. So for example, we ask if like witchcraft can be used to manage stress. So we tell a story about Etienne who pays for a ritual to help his business that's suffering. And then we ask people if he's going to feel better after paying for that ritual. So 35% of the sample thinks he will in the fact feel better if he does this. Um, but 58 say, no, he's still gonna be stressed. Um, but if we ask people what most people think, it's a little bit different story in that they, most people now think that he will feel better. So he will feel better is what most people think others think. Um, so some sense in which stress management may be a factor here. And Nathan has another paper where they look, where they basically offer um, little fetishes or amulets to beer sellers to give them protection while they're doing their beer sales. Um, and they find some evidence that it increases efforts and in sales. Um, the other sort of hypothesis we're interested in is this idea of supernatural authority. 
So that sort of having these supernatural powers is seen as a necessary component to effective leadership. Um, and so we, we asked people about the strength of their village chiefs, uh, Bokoko, um, and sort of people tend to think that strong leaders are effective at using these uh, types of traditional supernatural powers um, to protect the village. Um, and then that third class of explanation is the one that I'm most interested in, is trying to explore this notion of cultural mismatch. So we're going to take advantage of that village's data um, and the fact that there's variation in exposure to Christian missions over the past century, and then also variation in their current sort of church infrastructure, and see if we get heterogeneity in these effects based on exposure to Christianity. Um, so those are all things that are on my to-do list. Um, I, I think there's lots of really interesting questions to ask about these types of belief systems that are really quite prevalent. Though I just focused on Congo, these aren't sort of just unique to Congo. And I, I'm interested in this because I think it's really important to the way people understand their own lives, the way they understand morality. Um, it seems to be associated with these political and economic outcomes. So I find it quite fun and I really appreciate this opportunity to share the work with you. So thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think we still have some minutes left and then I believe people are waiting, can't wait to ask questions. So uh, if you have questions, um, can you put the hands up so I can, uh, okay, I can see one. Uh, how about Sean, Sean? Yes, there is. I'm thinking uh, here in your regression specification, you only include the belief of uh, each player or control for the uh, fixed fact of the first player. But I'm thinking, uh, why don't you just also interact with that belief? Because as you mentioned, uh, I think the higher order belief here matters as well. That means it's not only about my belief or other people's belief, it's mm -hmm. also about that. Uh, how much I believe other people's belief. Okay, so, so yeah. I think, uh, yeah, then that case, uh, the interaction term may uh, matter here. Uh, I mm -hmm. think it was about how much I believe other people's belief. Of course, okay, this interaction may not uh, completely capture uh, this part, but I think it can, given your uh, variables available, I think it can capture something interesting. Okay in this dimension. Yeah, and this is something we'd put in the appendix, but I, I, I agree with you, actually, I, I agree that it, it's time to bring it back <laughs> into the main part of the paper, um, even if it's to say that we don't find something consistent. Um, okay. Yeah, so we can do that. I mean, the short answer is that we don't find a consistent sort of effect on this interaction, except for the joy of destruction, where we find that you're less likely to decrease the other player's endowment if they have a strong belief and you have a strong belief. So some evidence of a mitigation of that negative effect, um, but that really only comes through in the joy of destruction game. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank um, you. Amy, go ahead. Hi, two, two questions. Um, one, I didn't understand the logistic of the game. So you group the 600 people in the area and they play at the same time. It was a real time game or it was, uh, I mean, different times. And, and, and the second question is, if you mentioned it at the beginning, this with witchcraft services and the witch doctors, uh, is there, are there any data on prices of those services? Um, so for the first question, no, people didn't do them at the same time. These are all one-on-one -on -one meetings in people's homes. So that means our enumerators had to return a week later with the payouts um, from their choices based on other people's choices as well. So we had to calculate payoffs and then bring them these envelopes. Um, so the players, the player needed to build trust with, with the researchers um, that they will bring the money in a week time, right? Yes, yeah. So there would have to be some level of trust that we would return and pay them out. We did <laughs> return and you know do our payouts, but um, yeah, we we have some questions on like trust in researchers, so we can just look at if the effect varies by that. But I would be surprised if these like coefficients on the belief in witchcraft systematically varies with the. But yeah, it's something we can check. Um, then the second part was, oh yeah, I would love that such a data set if it existed. Um, I think it would be super interesting to better understand the relationship between these traditional healers 
and you know what services they offer, some of which will be sort of more medical in the way we understand modern medicine, some of which will be aimed towards supernatural ailments. Um, but as far as I know, there's no good big scale systematic data on, on this, and it would just be super interesting to understand. Thanks. Um, well, I, I have a question as well. <laughs> I, I think that this, uh, towards the end, you showed the slides that uh, uh, these other traits uh, associated with um, witchcraft belief, like mm -hmm. honesty, uh, that kind of other traits. And then, is, mm -hmm. is that correct that uh, you show that people tend to associate uh, like dishonesty with people who have strong belief in witchcraft? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so this kind of uh, make me wonder to what extent those people playing the game really respond to the witchcraft, uh, witchcraft belief or is that they automatically associate these other traits with these people who have strong beliefs in witchcraft. So yeah. if, if I think like, you know, oh, uh, well, if someone have a strong belief in witchcraft, I'm more likely to be dishonest. Mm -hmm. then I won't treat him well because, because of the dishonesty instead of belief in the witchcraft. Yeah. So, no, so, this, so yeah. this is for your question, like it's really the belief, witchcraft belief that affects the pro-social behavior or is actually the other traits associated with this mm -hmm. uh, belief in witchcraft. You know, this is related to my very early question, like there are other traits that might lead people to be uh, more uh, believe uh, believing in the witchcraft. Mm -hmm. and, you know, those people who are dishonest, or it's yeah. you know people who are more noble, like they are less likely to believe in the witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think you're right. Like this, I basically showed in that third part that the types of inferences people make over someone with positive or negative characteristics is different. Uh, like so, you're more likely to associate these negative traits with a believer in witchcraft, and so. It does make it harder to say, I mean, what we've randomly varied in those previous experiments is the other player's strength of belief, but it's possible that then what explains that is that they think that these types of people are bad people. Yeah, in a sense. yeah. exactly. So yeah. It's sort of like a, a, a mechanism or channel for why they're behaving like that. But right. yeah. I, I mean, did you, um, did you show us, Sarah, the uh, summary statistics for people with strong and sort of low beliefs in witchcraft. I mean, I'm presuming people with strong beliefs may have lower education. Just on Simon's point, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you did, did we see that? I'm not. I don't recall. Yeah, we did. I went fast. <laughs> okay, sorry. sorry. Yeah. yeah so but, but maybe you can show these other traits in that paper as well. Yeah. So what I could show you is like for the conjunction fallacy, I split the sample by strong believers and weak believers. And sort of, but you would rather see it by which by which trait? Sorry. So, for example, in that very early table, you showed the uh, the beliefs by controlling their um, education and gender, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. But so maybe you know, I'm not sure if it makes sense to also include in these other traits in that table as a right hand side controls. I don't know. Oh, I just don't have that data. Like, I don't know if someone's honest yeah. or right. jealous or vindictive. Oops, yeah. they probably wouldn't tell me, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but yeah. Um, okay. But I, we could do more comprehensive sort of correlates of, of belief in witchcraft with the type of data we do have. So, yeah, yeah. I, and I, I think that... um, uh, Sean has another question. Sean? Yes, yeah, so Sarah, so I'm thinking uh, about. Uh, maybe um, uh, so some general, um, more fundamental beliefs that uh, may affect the results here. So I, I don't know whether you have uh, talked about it and I may miss this information. Uh, I'm thinking about, for example, so here, in the end, whether this, uh, the effect of this belief uh, on uh, whether the behavior is pro-social or anti-social, uh, also depends on people's belief about the how this belief system is uh, explained, how social no norm is explained or executed. So in many cases, it can be explained and executed at the discretion of these uh, political elites, for example. Mm. So 
I think in that case, this belief system of how it works also depend on the political power or other dimensions of the institutions. Um, so I think that could be more fundamental uh, conditions that could affect the results here. I, I don't know whether you think about uh, these questions. Yeah, okay. So, so I, for the most part, I think these beliefs are fairly decentralized. So like if I felt wrong by someone, I could pursue whatever sort of course of action with a, you know, a witch doctor or a sorcerer if I wanted to. But I do think local leaders do play an important role in the sense that they encourage these beliefs and that they believe that they're real <laughs> and that they believe that part of their own role is to protect the community from these negative harms of these beliefs. So like from bad actors who may try to harm others through supernatural means. Um, I guess maybe I'm not fully, what, what do you have in mind exactly aside from maybe variation in political structures, which is something we could look at. Okay, for, for example, so, so here the, in the end, for example, you say, okay, this, um, the belief that means the witchcraft can be uh, used to punch someone, right? Mm -hmm. But this is a punishment, or whether people really do some bad things, this explanation and execution depends on the real political power who can just execute and explain it. So in okay. the end, so how people believe this uh, belief system and how they think whether the belief system uh, is in their own interest or just uh, against, against the uh, the norm they believe in their mind it is a, there is a there is a difference between okay a good norm in their mind and the actual norm uh, executed and explained in society okay. Uh, okay. and in that end that would affect how people think about this belief system and whether this belief would just uh, lead to the prosocial or antisocial behavior mm -hmm. Okay, I'll have to think about that and, and what possibly we could do to explore some of that in, in the existing data we have. So I'm not sure, it's I guess my answer. Yeah, so, so it's, uh, I think it is, uh, uh, maybe it's hard to, uh, to do this uh, in, in this experiment because I think I'm thinking about how to explain these results. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think uh, how, how this uh, belief system affects the, whether it is antisocial or prosocial also depends on some fundamental okay. uh, conditions, yeah, and also other system, other uh, other beliefs about this um, political system, political um, uh, uh, power, okay. and other dimensions of the institutions as well. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, I guess we run out of time, and then uh, Sarah has been very kind and generous for staying longer <laughs> and so, uh, answering more questions. So, and thank you so much once again for this fascinating talk. And then um, um, thank you again for uh, making time, but with, to be with us to share your research. And uh, so, please join us thanking Sarah. Thank and, you, guys. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. And thanks so for all your really good questions. Made me think, so I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.